All right, it says that we are live and it is Tuesday night and guys, we are in for such a treat. I have been doing conversations with Commodores for two and a half years. I look forward to meeting former teammates, new, new teammates from all different decades. But I hope you guys are joining us tonight. We have got Coach John Croft. Coach is a highly, I can't, I can't, I'm not even going to begin to talk about his resume because it's three pages. Coach Crop, I am so pleased that you're able to join us this evening. How are you doing tonight, sir? Well, I'm, I'm equally thrilled or even more thrilled. Uh, thank you so much for asking me to do this. Oh, it's, I should have gotten to you two years ago. That is my fault, not yours. And you and I will have words with your son, David, after a while about technology. But guys, what you need to know is that Coach Crop not only was a three-year, two-way starter in the late 50s for Vanderbilt, he earned two degrees from Vanderbilt. He then was served in the military in Europe. He then came back stateside and had a very distinguished teaching and coaching career and on and on and on. And I am just so pleased that you're here tonight. So thank you, sir. And where, where is home for you these days? Home for me these days is in Oxford, Mississippi, home of the, home of the National Championship Baseball Rebels. And oh, you, everybody you, here is excited about that. You, you had to cut deep. I, <laughs> I am a Vandy Boys fan through and through as many of us are. But I know that Ole Miss is very happy for its national championship. That's for sure. Coach, Coach Crop, you may be, as far as I know, the only Vanderbilt football player who was from Huron, South Dakota. Please tell us how in the world did you, your family, end up in South Dakota? Well, uh, there was nine years before I got to South Dakota. I was actually born in Wolf Point, Montana, which is, uh, was 1,800 people when I was there. And I checked and it's all the way up to 2,000 now, uh, <laughs> 80 years later. They're in boom times now, huh? <laughs> My dad was a missionary to the American Indians mm -hmm. and uh, he had 40 churches in four states. And uh, after, after nine years, they determined that it was better if he would move to Huron, South Dakota and work out of Huron College. Huron was a bigger town than Wolf Point was and more, not in the mainstream, but certainly more in the mainstream than Wolf Point, Montana was. And then how many years did you spend in Huron? I was there for six years. Mm -hmm. And then my dad was getting older and older and older and the, uh, the Presbyterian Church, because of his age and workload, uh, found him a position in Maryville, Tennessee, mm -hmm. working with the rural mountain folks there. So when I was a junior in high school, uh, we packed up and went again and uh, unloaded our stuff in Maryville, Tennessee. Well, growing up in Montana and South Dakota and then moving as a 15 or 16 year old to the deep south, I mean, Tennessee, that had to have been a real cultural change, a, a, a geography change, a weather change. How did you deal with all that? Or did you and the rest of the family just kind of roll with it? Well, I didn't deal with it very well. My first day in class, one of the strong teachers in the high school called on me in class and she said, uh, John Crop, and I said, yep. And she said, yes, ma'am. And I said, she said, don't you know to say yes, ma'am? And I said, nope. And she said, no, ma'am. So I got acclimated to learn how to speak Southern very rapidly. And I was the laughing stock of the 11th grade at Maryville, Tennessee. Well, you were the dude from up north. You weren't <laughs> one of the locals. Coach, let me ask you if you could change the angle just a little bit. We're only seeing from about the bottom of your mouth. There you go. That's perfect. 
did you play sports growing up as a youngster up north or did that start when you came south to Tennessee? No, I started, I started early on. Uh, I remember South Dakota sports more than I remember uh, 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 let me just let that ring. Okay. The uh, I, I, I ran track and played baseball and played basketball and did all of those things. What was your strong sport when you were young? What was your best sport when you were, say, 10, 11, and 12 years old? Yeah, I def definitely did. And uh, I, I loved all sports. Uh, I wasn't great at anything, but uh, I enjoyed getting to play. And I was in small schools, so it wasn't hard to get into the lineup. Did you, did you have a favorite sport then? Or did you just, whatever was the season, that was your favorite? I, I would say baseball and football were always the favorites. Mm -hmm. Basketball got us through the winter months, but, uh, and I enjoyed it, but uh, baseball and football were my favorites. Well, I was gonna ask you, did you have to deal with snow at the end of football season or the beginning of baseball season in, in South Dakota or how did all that work or were the seasons later in the season, the uh, year? No, we definitely had to deal with snow and uh, and they would plow the field if necessary and uh, do whatever they would do to get it off the field. And then you went out there and did the best you could and what you had to work with. So you we were didn't have any synthetic turf at that time. No. So, but you were a junior when you moved to Maryville, Tennessee. Yes. And what was your, and maybe you just described it with the teacher, I don't know. What was your welcome to the South moment for you as a, as a junior in high school? Well, I would say that was certainly that. The, there was, it was a small school. I think there was 93 people in our, in our class. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started, we moved in the summer and I thought I was gonna die because I didn't know what to do with heat and humidity. And, mm -hmm. and when we bought our house, we didn't have an air conditioner. And finally my dad broke down and bought one window unit and we all would spend the whole day in that one room. And, uh, but I would go down to the high school in the evenings and meet some of the players as they were working out on their own, getting ready for school to start and the season to start. And uh, they were very nice to me. Well, I was gonna ask or, or comment, even though you were a, a foreigner, a Northern guy, a lot of times sports can kind of pave the way toward friendships. So you're saying that they were accommodating and welcoming to you? Absolutely. In fact, one of the first persons I met was a guy named Scott Trundle. And Scott and I both signed scholarships in 1957 to come to Vanderbilt and play football. We both got recruited off the same high school football team. And he's still a dear friend today. Well, and I'm going to get to this part in just a minute, but at what point did you, in your mind, make a decision or realize, you know, I can play sports in college. I've got enough abilities. Was this, were coaches telling you this? Was this you sizing yourself up against the competition? When did that come to fruition for you that it was going to be I a had reality? A very, I had a very motivational assistant coach at Maryville High School who went on to be a great coach and a great hero of mine really. His name was Ollie Keller and Ollie Keller played tailback at the University of Tennessee and then came to Maryville High School getting started in coaching and uh, he was a tremendous motivator of mine and uh, he, he pushed me hard and uh, He'd run wind sprints with us after practice and said, you know, if we can, if you, anytime you can beat me, we'll stop. And of course, none of us could beat him. And so we ran as long as he wanted us to. We probably wasn't that much older than you guys. He was, I mean, he was certainly, we were 17, 18, 16. He was in his early 20s, 21, yeah, yeah. 22. Yeah. Well, was what a, positions were you playing mainly in high school? Uh, in high school, 
the, the part that helped me get a scholarship was I was a pretty good linebacker, mm -hmm. but you had to play both ways. And therefore, uh, in the scheme of things in those days, as a linebacker, you either had to be a center or a guard. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, they decided I'd cause less problems as a guard than I would as a center. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure it was a little more than that. But how did you escape Maryville College, which I know has football right there in your hometown? Well, that was very, very easy because uh, when Vanderbilt came calling and knocking on the door, mm -hmm. my mother was so impressed with their academics that it became very, very clear to me very early on that she would not say it, but that was her choice for where I would go to school. If I was fortunate enough to have somebody pay in my way, she wanted me to get the best education I possibly could. Well, growing, growing up in, in South Dakota and Montana, had you ever heard of the Southeastern Conference or followed college football in the South at all? Absolutely not. Uh, the uh, Probably the team that the University of Minnesota was the mm -hmm one we would get on the radio and probably uh, that was the school that I followed the most mm -hmm. in my days up north. But it, I, I would assume that the, for the year or two, two years that you were down in Maryville, certainly UT, Kentucky, Vanderbilt, I mean, the SEC schools, I'm sure were flooded in your, your uh, knowledge and information about those programs at some oh, point. Absolutely, and of course, Vanderbilt and Tennessee being in-state schools have been rivals forever. Uh, mm -hmm. People remind me, well, in a rivalry, both sides win. And I said, yeah, but back in those days when I was playing, both sides did win, you yeah. know. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it that was the game of the year that we all looked for. And it was the last game of the year. And we oh. couldn't wait. And it was probably one of my biggest thrills when in my third year in college, we went to Knoxville and shut them out 14 to nothing. And mm -hmm. I can still remember the joy that that brought to, to the crop household anyway. I'm sure that it did. Now coach, you know, Vanderbilt went to the 55 Gator Bowl against Auburn. Had you moved to Tennessee by then or were you still up, up North? I had just, I had just, I had just gotten there. That was my first year in the South. And that, that certainly made an impression on me, you know, that wow. they, were good, they were good enough to be in the Gator Bowl. In other words, I didn't look at choosing Vanderbilt as choosing a losing football school. Mm -hmm. uh, Vanderbilt was, was competitive, without a doubt. And, uh, and so that part, I chose academics. Mm -hmm. uh, but football, football didn't have a lot to do in the decision academics did. I, I was thrilled. I, I think I had three scholarship offers, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Vanderbilt. I had to choose between those three schools, but uh, it was an easy decision. My mother made sure it was an easy decision. Well, on behalf of Vanderbilt Nation, we thank you for making the choice to go to the right school when you I did. And I'll tell you, I would never, we would never have met your son later on down the road. I suspect he may have been on a different college path, but we'll get to David in just a minute. And as much as we mess on David, he's got some good qualities that we will get to as, as well. Coach. Well, I'm, I'm certainly proud of my kids. I've got two children. I've got a daughter here at Oxford. You know, they, they say when you get old, you better move to where one of your kids are. Mm -hmm. And I chose Oxford because of traffic. <laughs> oh, David said it was because you didn't like hockey and you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like David. Yeah. He's uh, a hockey buff. But coach, out about it. The, those mid 50s Vanderbilt teams were, were pretty strong teams, of course, going to the Gator Bowl. Then you're a freshman the fall of 57. Did you know who your roommate was going to be before you showed up for fall camp? How did they determine those things back then? Well, I don't know how they determined them, but since 
my high school friend and still friend, Scott Trundle, mm -hmm. was also coming on a scholarship. We naturally thought we should room together and it lasted about six weeks. And then we asked the coaches to let us go our separate ways. <laughs> Different personalities just couldn't live together, huh? That's exactly right. You and know, it probably the saved nice the friendship. Thing Vanderbilt was they had single rooms. You didn't have to have you didn't have to have a roommate. You could or you didn't you didn't have to, but they had more single rooms than double rooms. Do you remember the name of your dorm back then? Uh, yeah, I was in the I was in the Kerwin Towers, I think they were called, uh, but it was uh, it was right across from that uh, church there, right on West End. Mm -hmm. Well, the Coach, the, the whole campus has almost completely turned over from a residential standpoint. Yes. So it may have been, I mean, it, it may be two buildings later. Who, who knows? I know, you know, with the Carmichael Towers all down and they're building all these just awesome mini campuses. But going back to, to Scott, your high school friend who signed, it probably saved your friendship that y'all didn't live together after those six weeks. <laughs> I, I don't think there's any doubt about that being <laughs> the truth. And, and I think it was I think it was smart that they had so many single rooms. Well, let's see. Coach, I've got here, David gave me some notes. You had Coach Dick Hickman was your linebacker coach. And then Buford Ray, AKA Baby Ray, was your O-line coach. And for those of you who are watching and may not appreciate football in the 50s, the fact that Coach Crop played both ways is just phenomenal. And how did, did you have to think out of one side of your, your brain for offense and the other side for defense? How, how did you process that? That was just the football program you grew up with. You did the same thing in high school. Mm -hmm. And the guy that gets credit for that or the blame is Bear Bryant because Bear Bryant was at Alabama and he was convinced that his players were better in better condition than his opponents. And so he said, we're going to make them play. We average 50, 55 minutes a game. And, and he said, in the end of the game, the fourth quarter, my players are going to be better than their players are because we're, we're in better shape. Wow. Now, at your, your biggest, your tallest height and your biggest weight, what did you, at Vanderbilt, what were you? Well, when I signed out of high school, I was uh, in the high 160s. I might have been 170. Mm -hmm. And I was going to college to play in the offensive line. And, uh, and they, of course, started making us. We never lifted weights in high school. Right. And the minute I got to Vanderbilt, they sent us down to Old Palmer Fieldhouse. And they had a room down there with some weights. And we almost killed each other because we didn't know how. But they started bulking us up. And. I think by the time I graduated, I'd gotten all the way up to 181 or 182. Well, I was going to ask you, Coach, did you ever top out, you know, 200 or 190s? But I might, I might, might have in my fifth year because uh, <laughs> I they had good food and I ate, and they wanted me to get gain weight, so uh, I, I bulked up as best I could. The biggest That's guy right. in our line, Scott Trundle, was mm -hmm. one of our biggest players. And he weighed, uh, I think, 218 or something like that. He was a tough Well, I was going to say, you know, and now the average lineman at Vanderbilt's probably 285, maybe 300. You know, every generation, they're just bigger, faster, and, and stronger. And it, isn't it amazing how big some of those guys are? When you watch them. When you it watch, blows me away. You know, I I still go over and watch Ole Miss practice, or I'm a I'm a junkie. If I can get if I can get in the gate and talk my way in, I'll I'll go watch it. And they they certainly are gotten huge. Well, I was going to say, Coach, when you watch the modern college game, there's there's some of the game I know that you recognize, of course. Four downs, the, you got to go ten yards. All those basics are still there. 
But what is so very different is the execution of the game. It's with all the passing, with all, how big everybody is, how fast the game is. Do you enjoy the modern game? Do you, do you enjoy watching it? Well, I'm a football junkie, so yes, I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I accept change. And uh, it's very, you know, Ole Miss has got uh, the guy that he'd rather throw it sideways than run it anywhere. And, uh, and he's a heck of a coach, by the way. And uh, so I, I, I enjoy watching the game of chess, you know, game of checkers. People trying to outsmart the other person. I was getting ready to say that part of the game, the strategy, that'll never go away. Nope. And, and, and while there may be slick plays and, and just different every decade, it's the strategies, I think, that really separates a lot of the, the mediocre teams from the good teams. I don't mean to skip around. I want to go back to Vanderbilt, and I want to talk about during the time that when David and I were at Vanderbilt in the 80s, it was as many hours as they could keep you busy with football, they would. Then the NCAA changed it to this joke of 20 hours a week. <laughs> During your time, how many hours a week did you average with football versus studies versus anything else? Well, they, they, we didn't have long, lengthy practices mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't have, you know, uh, I didn't feel overwhelmed with the amount of time that they required uh, in season. Uh, seemed like they wanted us to do more out of season than they did in season. I think and, you're right about that. And, and they practices weren't, uh, oh, that physical because they wanted to keep you healthy. I mean, doesn't mm -hmm. mean we didn't have contact. We did, mm -hmm. but... Uh, it was uh, it was a different game, but it was an enjoyable game. Was Parmer Fieldhouse used for more than lifting weights? Was it an active football uh, used facility, or had McGugan started to be used by then? No, McGugan wasn't even out of the ground. Uh, that mm -hmm. was our dressing room, and that was that was Joe Warden's training room and showers and. Uh, meeting rooms. I don't remember us going in having that much chalk work on the blackboards mm -hmm. as much as walkthroughs and things on the grass. But the, the Palmer field, I, I shed a little tear when they, I don't, I think they've torn it down and yeah. I uh, kind of, kind of, kind of, Hurt, hurt, hurt me to see it, see it go because a, a lot of people wanted it to be changed into like a museum piece yeah. to, for the football program. But I think ultimately it was taken down because it's going to eventually be the electrical or the whatever the station is that's going to the power station. I think for the new facility that's being being. Well, built. I know. I know facilities are so critical to uh, people recruit off their facilities. You know, that's, that's the show and tell. And so I, I see both sides of it. I wanted it kept for memorial sake, but I, I can understand. And, and I spent my whole life in college administration. So I understand both sides of the coin. Coach, was Palmer also used as a locker room or field house for games or was the stadium, was Dudley Stadium, did they have locker rooms during well, your half, time? At, at halftime, we went back to Palmer Field House and got, our, I thought. got, got our briefings and everything like that. Yeah. Wow, well, it, and where was the scoreboard during your years? I don't, I just think we had a scoreboard on the other end. Mm -hmm. and not on that on the Jess Neely drive side yeah, of the stadium the, I know mm -hmm. this that was our practice field out there where the end zone bleachers and everything is now mm -hmm. that was where we practiced you know a lot before they 
got involved with the other end where the baseball field was. So, well, it's they, it's there's, they, there's not the things they do was, <laughs> you know, in those days they signed a lot more than they wanted to keep. Well, and so mm -hmm. one of the ways <laughs> it was it was very morbid. But when we would during two days when we'd come out to practice, we'd throw our helmets in a laundry basket. And when you came back out the next morning to practice, your helmet was sitting out there with your tape name on the front. And that's how they found out who packed their bags and quit at night. The guy that didn't show up and pick up his helmet had gone home. <laughs> wow. Well, how, how many, if you know, how many were out there when two -a days began versus how many toughed it out till when the season actually? Well, I hope nobody checks me on this, but I think there was like 40 some in our in our freshman class. And we were close to, uh, you know, in the 90s or something as a team, mm -hmm. but we weren't in the 40s after. Well, two I think that was that was well before the NCAA imposed the, uh, the signing class limitations and scholarship limitations. Was it expected of most of your teammates to be two-way players? Was all, were almost all players that way? Oh yeah, that was. I mean, that was that was just college football. Like mm -hmm. I said, Coach Bryant had he ruled with an iron fist, and and everybody played the same way. And then finally, in my later years, my maybe my last year, uh, Paul Dietzel down at uh, LSU came up with the idea of uh, trying to use more players and get an advantage. He came up with the Chinese bandits. Yeah, yeah. And they were they were the two-way team. And, and yeah. we implemented that, that method of play in my fifth year there. We had the, the go team, the stop team, and the offensive team. And they'd find different times to run different teams out there. The bandits. Okay, I got to tell you. We got a whole bunch of Commodores here with us tonight. So let me tell you who's on here. Hopefully you'll recognize some names. We got Dwayne Jones, who of course I know you know. We got Christy Houck. Hey, Christy. We got Kenny Cole, Darren Rothenberg. Let me see if I can see them all because they've all scrolled through. And I apologize if I, I can't see the others right now, but we've got a whole bunch of. We'll let that go, Coach. Yeah. As I'm talking with Coach John Crop, two-way Vanderbilt, three-year starter, two degrees from Vanderbilt. We hadn't even gotten into his military or coaching and, and education teaching career after that. And also the son of also Commodore David Crop, who played in the 80s. Coach, I appreciate you sharing some of what your experience, but I got so many more questions about that time period. Talk well, about your head coach. What kind of man was he? What kind of leader? What kind of coach was he? You talk about our head coach at Benville? Yes, sir. The, the, the Gip twins, Al and Art. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Art was clearly the head coach, but mm -hmm. Al was very influential in what we did. And... Uh, uh, you know, we we had great respect for our coaches, and uh, like all players, you know, you you gripe because they were working you too hard. But uh, we, uh, Billy Hickman, was very, you know, he was my linebacker, defensive coach, and that's the part that I liked the most about the game. And I had great respect. Well, I had great respect for all of our coaches. Coach, did you try to pattern your game after other any other players who were maybe ahead of you in college or who you had been able to see? Or was that not something that, that players did back then? Well, uh, you certainly, uh, you know, George Diedrich was a linebacker playing ahead of me and a very good one. And, mm -hmm. and I certainly, uh, you know, tried to be fill his shoes and be be the kind of player he was and so uh you you, you would do those kinds of things you, billy grover was our nose guard and billy was was a great great worker great great player and tom moore was a running back phil king 
early on. And so we had good players. You had some real athletes. You sure did. Talk about Monday through Friday from an academic standpoint. Was it tough to balance the academics with the athletics? Did the regular students, how did they treat the football players in an academic environment? Oh, I think they, in other words, when I walked around campus, I didn't feel like I was a football player going to school with a bunch of other types of people. We, we mixed and we mingled. Uh, I got very involved in fraternity life. And uh, so, you know, that was, that was socially, that was how I spent a lot of my time and, mm -hmm. and got dear friends in, in Nashville forever from that experience. So uh, I, I didn't feel, I think nowadays the football player is the big man on campus, you know, and certainly he's the rich man on campus. Uh, when I was in my days at Vanderbilt, I felt like I was another student, you know, and that uh, we we had we had good friends. Did those friends show up on Saturdays in the stadium? Did the oh, yeah. student uh, body show up? The, you know, I think I think uh, our stadium only held thirty in the low thirty, something like mm -hmm. that, and and it certainly wasn't full to overflowing unless we were playing Tennessee in town. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it took it took an arch rival and a lot of their fans to fill the stadium. And uh, I think I'd, I would guess we were, we, we could get 20, 25,000 people in there. And speaking of, of rivals, did you get to play games in Tuscaloosa, in Athens? Did you travel? I mean, I know alternate years, but I didn't know if each SEC school played the others. And I know back then, Georgia Tech and Tulane were still part of the conference. Yes, they were. And, and we always liked to go to Tulane because... I wonder why. <laughs> after the game was over, they would give us some free time on the town. <laughs> hope I they couldn't imagine. All, hope New they found all their players to get on the plane. But... Uh, <laughs> We, I enjoyed, yes, uh, I really look forward to going to the bigger stadiums. And of course, being from Maryville, mm -hmm. you know, the highlight of my career was always the last game, which was Tennessee. Sure, and, sure. Uh, we really, really, you know, pointed for that game as far as that's concerned. Well, let me, let me test your knowledge a little bit, not your knowledge, but your memory a little bit. Do you remember certain players on opposing teams? Like, for example, Kenny Cole wanted to know if you were a contemporary of Leroy Jordan, who played at Alabama. Were you guys close in age? Couldn't remember his years. I don't years. remember Leroy Jordan that much. Uh, I'm trying to think who the Alabama players were, because I was in ROTC, and so we had to go to summer camp. Mm -hmm. And when we'd go to summer camp, there'd be football players from your opponents there. You might be in the dormitory with them. And uh, wow. you know, I, I look forward to that, you know, mm -hmm. some of the Ole Miss and Alabama players. I don't, I think Leroy maybe was, I'm not sure about the age of Leroy in, in my playing time. Well, what, what about other schools? Did you know well, any of these players? Fran Tarkington was the quarterback at Georgia. Right. And, uh, you know, Johnny Majors was the tailback at Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And then Billy Majors followed him. And uh, so I think Lou Michaels maybe was playing up at Kentucky. And uh, so, yeah, we saw, we saw the, saw the big boys. And uh, I was going to say, those are some pretty big names right there that, you guys competed against. Well, and the reason I get a little fuzzy is I came back and coached at Vanderbilt for five years mm -hmm. with Steve Sloan. And uh, and so I can remember when we went with Alabama, went down to play Alabama and Coach Bryant was leaning up against the goalpost. You know, the vis visiting team, both teams go out and walk the field about two mm -hmm. hours for the game. 
-hmm. And uh, Coach Bryant with that hat of his was leaned against the goalpost and Steve was out there and I was walking close to Steve and he said, hey boy, what are you doing out here? <laughs> you know, he said, I got bad news for you, boy. We got a really good team. <laughs> he was right. <laughs> well, but when you, after you graduated with your degrees at, at Vanderbilt, was it already set into place that you'd go into the military? Absolutely. An obligation. In other words, being in ROTC at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. uh, well, one thing it did for me, I got a paycheck from being in ROTC, and then I owed the service two years. And so I knew that as soon as I got out of school, I was headed wherever they were going to send me, and they sent me to Germany. And uh, that was a, a great opportunity. So you would have been in Germany 62, 3, 4 time period? Yeah, that's exactly the years. Mm -hmm. And and then when I got over there, uh, the general wanted to have mil military football so that the players, the, the service kids, would have something to do on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. So I got this call to come into the general's office, and he said, I hear you're a football coach. And I said, well, I'd like to be. He said, well, get out there and get us some coaches and get us a team and get us a schedule and get to playing. <laughs> I said, that's a lot to do. He said, well, you can use my plane anywhere you need to go. And so he would fly me around Germany and I'd go to bases and have tryout camps and, and everybody wanted to make the team because then they could get out of uniform and come play football for three months. And uh, we, there were some great players over there. Ronnie I was going was... to ask you, did you have, were there SEC? Former yeah, players? Ronnie Hart, one of the best players in that league that was Ronnie Hartline from Oklahoma. He was a mm -hmm. great, great running back. And mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we ran into a, well, they were all college players, you know, that we would recruit to our team. And we were fifth core and then seventh core had a team and, was I was going to say, is that who played against each other? It was all within the Army. They were the different divisions that were in in Europe, and uh, we would uh, we would go from place to place. We didn't they didn't fly us around like they do nowadays. We we'd have to get on a train or a bus or something. I remember we went to Berlin to play. That was an experience. I know? bet. <laughs> and had the was the wall up at that time. The wall time? was up and. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, we were we didn't know whether we should win that game or lose because we wanted to get out of town after it was over. Uh -huh. Wow. Well, that I'm sure that in and of itself is a very unique experience. You could probably write a book on that alone. But your military career, you, you eventually come back stateside. And is that when you take up the next part of your career? You start. Yeah, I even I even extended in the army. I was supposed to get out in like January or February, and I knew I wanted to coach, so I got talked the general into letting me have a, like a six month extension mm -hmm. to stay in the service and then come back in June. And I long distance got a job at Southwest High School in Atlanta, Georgia, not Southwest to Cab. Right. But this was. Uh, this was before integration. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, you tell you how much the racial problems were in our country. That was a coach there in 65 and 66. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Atlanta Braves had just come to Atlanta. Yeah. The Boston Braves. And they had a pretty good outfielder named Hank Aaron. Mm -hmm. And Hank Aaron bought a house about a block from our high school. And uh, that was a thrill for me because I got to meet him and know him. And in fact, he even gave me a pair of his baseball shoes. And uh, wow. I made a big mistake because when I was coaching the high school baseball team, I had a kid that didn't have any shoes. And so I gave him Hank Aaron shoes to wear <laughs> so he could play baseball. Wow. I'd like to have them in my memorabilia package yeah. nowadays. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you saw my conversation with Doug Nettles from several weeks ago. No. I know you know, know Doug or know of Doug. 
Great. And Doug was, was from Albany at one point and then moved to the Nashville area, but your paths would, I don't think would have ever have crossed because he may not have been old enough at that time that you were there. But coach, I, I would be remiss without mentioning your childhood sweetheart. And David puts in the notes that you guys, 61 years, that is truly, truly remarkable. Well, she's a remarkable woman. And uh, we, uh, we met at Maryville High School in 1955. Mm -hmm. Took me six years to get her to say yes. So we really been going together for 67 years. And well, Coach, if anything, you're persistent. You're <laughs> consistent and persistent. Well, her uncles were in the car business, Amos and Andy Buick in Maryville, and they moved their dealership to Chattanooga our senior year. And uh, we, uh, we, we, we dated long distance in our senior year in high school. and. Then she went to the University of Chattanooga and I went to Vanderbilt and we wore out cars. I was going to say, Ford. what is that? that was only is that hours. 40? What's the road that connects Chattanooga to, to oh, Nashville? Gosh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know. It wasn't, wasn't those areas though. Probably state or county roads at that time. Um, I'm going to say, David, if you're calling your dad right now, you need to be watching the show and not calling him so much. I know his show, his phone's been blowing up, but I'm gonna I'm gonna defend my son. That's my wife, who is uh, <laughs> she doesn't know that we're doing this show, and she's pretty persistent when she wants something. She's uh, <laughs> well, I I humbly apologize to her, you and David, but I'll never admit that publicly. But coach, you, you get stateside and you start your coaching and teaching career and you don't stop coaching and teaching until what year did you finally retire? Well, uh, here's that story. I coached two years of high school in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I went to Bristol, Tennessee High School and was the head coach for six years. Uh, we had some success there. And uh, George McIntyre uh, hired me. Now, let me get this straight. No, Steve Sloan got the Vanderbilt job, mm -hmm. hired me at Vanderbilt, then took me with him to Texas Tech. And, uh, and then we finally, while I was at Texas Tech, I saw Daryl Royal and Frank Broyles, two icons, both retire in their 50s from college coaching. And, and I started looking around and I said, I don't want to work for a living. What am I going to do? And I was working with Roy Kramer. And uh, I said, and CM Newton, and I said, you guys got to get me into college administration because I want to stay around college athletics all my life. And so they did. I, uh, I went up to Kentucky and coached one year and then they had a compliance came in and they needed somebody to be a compliance officer. So they had a coach get a new coach and I got to get into administration, which I did until I was 76 years old. I retired in 2016, had a lot of fun. Wow. Well, I know you coached at Vanderbilt two different times. You were under Sloan in, in 73 or so. And then you were back with Coach Matt in 84 and 85. I want you to take us to that September game, 1984 in Tuscaloosa. It's one of the biggest wins for Vanderbilt in the last 50 years. I've had Kirk Page, Chuck Scott. I've had so many players and cheerleaders who were at that game and were part of that historic game. Where were you during that game? And what, what did that game mean to you? Well, it, I mean, that was, you know, the ultimate. If you could beat Alabama, you know, that, that was when you knew you were doing your job. And I always worked as an assistant coach in college out of the press box. I was the offensive coordinator. So I would call the plays from the press box. And uh, so, uh, 
the <laughs> that was before elevators and I used to tell people at halftime if you were behind it was hell going up through the stands to get into your seat in the press box because you had to go past all those irate fans and they let you know what they thought about your play calling. <laughs> but we had fun. I'm sure. Well, guys, if we didn't mention it, gosh, it's it's a who's who of schools and coaches that you've been a part of. Vanderbilt, of course, Texas Tech, you won the SWC championship in 76. Then you went to Old Miss, 78 to 82, Duke in 83, Vanderbilt, 84, 85. And then you moved into athletic administration and you worked under athletic director, Coach Kramer, as you mentioned. And then in 1991, 22 years working for CM Newton and Mitch Barnhart as, in, as an associate athletic director. And at some point or another, you were in charge over time of UK's 22 athletic teams. How does one person, <laughs> how, do you, how do you figure out what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis with such, such responsibilities? Well, like I said, it, uh, it, it was not as hard as it seems like it is because uh, everything wasn't moving as fast as it is now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I went to a lot of practices. I went to a lot of games. Uh, when the, whenever possible, I tried to see them all play and evaluate the coaches and see how they were treating the players. and. I kind of was a, you know, I was a, a friend of both the coach and the player, but I wanted to make sure it was working, that we weren't mm -hmm. getting out of hand and uh, being so bent on winning that we weren't doing the right thing with the kids. And uh, so that was how I kind of structured my thinking process. You know, when you love what you do, I don't think it's hard. When you enjoy who you're around, what your purpose is with your profession, I think it comes a lot, lot easier. But Coach Crop, we've got Coach Gary Shepard with us. We've got Tom Fitz. We've got Tyler Unziker. Thank you guys for coming on tonight. Coach John Crop. Coach, did you miss being on the field or being part of the day, the game day? responsibilities when you started working in compliance or became one of the associate ADs or had you had you done enough so to speak and it was time to move to your next phase yeah I think that's the way I would say that I transitioned that mm -hmm. that I you know okay been there done that enjoyed it now let's let's move on to the next challenge and uh, and so I I was happy wherever, wherever I was, I always told my wife, who's the, the rock of our family, you know, I said, what's unfair here is I feel like I'm raising other people's children and I've left you the full-time job of raising our children. And by the way, she did a heck of a job. And, uh, I, uh, uh, but, uh, Somebody told me a long, long time ago that a coach's scoreboard should really read not how many wins and how many losses, but how many good quality men out of how many boys have crossed through your, you know, your team. So many, how many of them did you help become the type of men that we need in our country for our families and in our, in our United States? Well, I, I don't think I could ever say it as eloquently as what you just said, but coach, after 40 years of coaching and administration in the college ranks, there's some folks who felt like you did a pretty fair job enough to where they have, and if, for some of you who don't know, in 2013 on the UK campus, there is John Crop Stadium, which is named after Coach Crop. It's the softball stadium. I want you to, to and I, I realize you're not, 
you're not a boastful man. I, I know that you're not a, you know, you're not one of these kind of guys. You'd rather root for on the front of the jersey than what's on the back of the jersey. But talk a little bit about that, that event and that honor, because I, I know that had to have been a good feeling. It was a, a, a tremendous feeling because, uh, and one of the reasons it happened was I worked for so many classy guys like Roy Kramer and C.M. Newton and Mitch Barnhart. And, and I can remember C.M. Newton calling me in his office and he said, John, you got to do something. And I said, well, what's the problem? He <laughs> said, well, they're just killing me and beating us up over this gender equity stuff. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we're spending all this money on the guys and we don't have any women's teams and we're not spending any money on the women's team. We got basketball and a couple other things, but we don't have. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And I said, he, he said, I called you in here to tell me what we're going to do. <laughs> and I said, well, if I was you, coach, I'd start a women's softball team here at Kentucky. And he said, go do it. <laughs> I think he said, damn it, go do it. And he said, right away, he said, as fast as you can. So that certainly, uh, you know, they were nice enough to do that. And I think the, the, the history of how we started softball and, and I always told people that baseball was always one of my favorites. But I said, softball is a whole lot better than baseball because one, it's played in two hours instead of three hours. And I said, and uh, if you, uh, uh, it's, only, it's only, I don't know, 45 feet to first base instead of 60 feet. And I said, I said, on top of that, the players are a whole lot better looking. And <laughs> it's just a whole lot better game. <laughs> So I've always been a lover of women's softball. Well, I don't know if it'll come to fruition at Vanderbilt, but I sure wish they would make a team. It's the only SEC school that doesn't have softball. I realize there may be a land locked issue for that and many other things, but I'd love for Vanderbilt to start, start a softball program. But, but coach, my gosh, I have so many other things I want to, I want to talk to you about, but, but, being a, a, a former player, being a coach, and then becoming a dad. I, I've never met your daughter, but I certainly knew David during our years at Vanderbilt and beyond. How did you handle the dad versus I need to coach my son dynamic as David was coming up through youth and high school sports? Well, I I'd always tried to be the supporter of the program and the coach that had the job mm -hmm. because I had been a coach. And so I tried really, really hard to be a parent and not be a coach on the sideline, second guessing the coach. And that's where I spent, uh, you know, all of, all of my energy as far as that's concerned. And I'm still fortunate enough to have a grandson that's a pretty good player out of Brentwood Academy. And uh, when I go watch him play, that's I, I try to to do the same thing. Not say why did you why did you run that play or why didn't you throw it to my grandson? I just try to enjoy the the game and uh, support the coach. Well, certainly, certainly. Um, how was the dynamics? David was a year or two ahead of me at Van, but I came in in the fall of '86. You were on staff for Coach Mack at the time David came to campus. How, how were those dynamics? Well, I, I don't, I, I can't remember the timing exactly, but I don't remember uh, ever being in a coach-son mm -hmm. relationship type mm -hmm. of thing. I remember being in other positions more than in a uh, trying to coach. I remember the first time I went to a practice and he did something wrong and the coach yelled at him how the hair stood up on the back of my neck because that coach <laughs> didn't cuss him. He just straightened him out, you know, but I, 
I was uh, definitely a, a dad that day and not a coach. Well, I was wondering if there were a lot of heads that turned to find you while that was going on. <laughs> well, and I tried to, yeah, I can remember at Vanderbilt, uh, peeking through the shrubbery or the trees and looking over the fence and uh -huh. watching practice at a distance where, you know, probably nobody knew I was there watching while he was uh, practicing. Sure. I think Watson was the coach. And uh, uh, so I, I tried, really tried to stay out of the way. Even though you guys may not have crossed paths, you may not have coached him, it had to have been a good feeling of you both being on the same squad for a period. Oh, yeah. I mean, you love your children. I mean, it's the most, the dearest thing that God gives us is, is children. And uh, so there's absolutely, you just uh, are very, very proud and, uh, and excited and uh, wishing nothing but the best for all involved. Well, Coach Crop, we've got just a couple more minutes and I'll, I'll get you out of here. And I sure appreciate your time this evening. It has been my pleasure getting to know you a little bit and hearing from you. But I want to ask you, you've been affiliated or associated with Vanderbilt Athletics and, and other schools for many years, but, but Vanderbilt is your alma mater. What makes you the most proud to tell people that you graduated twice and played at Vanderbilt? Well, I just think it's a great school. And uh, I think you're, you're privileged to, to have that opportunity. Uh, I know that with the, uh, I know it's harder now for Vanderbilt than it ever was with the integration of, of, of football teams, uh, the black athlete, you know, has brought so much speed and agility to the game uh, beyond the best of the Caucasian players. And so uh, it's, uh, I, I root for Vanderbilt as hard as I possibly can because I want them to succeed. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a valuable asset to the conference, you know, and uh, so uh, I, I want it to work. Well, I know that, that we all do. We're rooting for, for Coach Lee and his current staff. And I, I think he's changing the culture from within. I think the new facilities that are being discussed may be a big recruiting tool for them. Well, and he's running uphill because mm -hmm. everybody else already has all the facilities. Yeah. In other words, the facility race has gone past Vanderbilt and Vanderbilt's playing catch up yeah. in facilities, not being critical of anybody, you know, because different schools and different priorities. And, and as you said, the land, you know, the land is so, uh, there's so little land where Vanderbilt's located. It's yeah. not like a lot of these schools that they can just, so, well, let's build something here. Let's add a softball field. It's, mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that easily. So. No, it, not when you're close to downtown Nashville, that's for sure. Coach Crop, thank you, sir, for spending some time and sharing some of your journey. It has truly been my pleasure to talk with you this evening. Well, it has been my honor, and I mean that sincerely. I, I love the school, and I uh, uh, have just been thrilled to be able to spend time with you and uh, and catch up with uh, former Commodores you know I, I can remember coaching there with coach Wyndham you know and uh, and coach Wyndham was on here I truly apologize he briefly popped on and off <laughs> well he likes to remind me that when I was winning a lot of games as a high school fo football coach up at Tennessee High in Bristol he, he was the one that beat me in the state playoffs and he, he doesn't never <laughs> let me forget, he doesn't never let me forget that. No, once a coach, always a coach. But Coach Crop, yeah. stick around for just a second. I'm gonna do the sign off, but don't leave me just yet. Guys, yeah. this is why I do these programs. You guys keep showing up. We got all kind of awesome Commodores every week. 
we've got them lined up. I'm getting them set up all through September, October, and beyond. Please keep coming back. Coach Wyndham is still on with us, and he sends his love to you, Coach. That's awesome. <laughs> Hope you guys have a great week. Anchor down. <laughs>